Hey, welcome to Tank Talk. I'm your host, Bob Tankard, and we have some special guests tonight. And these guys don't come all the time together, but today they're together. We have representing, Representative Good to see you, Doctor. <laughs> Dylan Fernandez and Senator Julian Sear. Good to see welcome you, Doctor. Welcome here. Tankard. Welcome to the vineyard. I always love you guys when you guys come. You, 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 this makes a difference. You know, mm. you got this fresh look. You guys are right on key. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It makes, anybody, it makes a, good, a young guy say, gee, I want to be like that guy. I want to be out there. How are you guys doing? Good. Great. Good. Busy. Tell me something to think. Why are you here today? Yeah, I saw so, you earlier today. Uh, yeah, so we started the day off at Martha's Vineyard Community Services mm -hmm. talking about um, an item Julian actually got in the budget for community services around medically assisted treatment. Wow. Huge issue here on island in terms of having the resources to treat those suffering with, from mm -hmm. addiction. Um, and then we also, we got a bill passed in, uh, you know, in a, in a really short period of time, mm -hmm. right at the end of session, passed literally the last day of session uh, for Martha's Vineyard Community Services mm -hmm. to be able to expand their operation. Um, and so this bill allows them, it gives them a lot more acreage to be mm -hmm. able to expand services. And it's just such a, an incredible asset to the island. So making sure that they um, are not only there and supported, but also have the ability to grow to serve the, the needs of island residents was a priority for us. And so we, we gave them signed bills that were signed by the governor uh, that were recently signed into law. The, uh, that we, yeah. I passed through the House and Julian passed through I'm the I'm going to ask you a question about sure. that. I mean, but Julian, you were just put on a new committee, weren't you? Or the charge of a new committee? So yeah, so, so right now in the legislative cycle, um, we're starting a new session. Mm -hmm. uh, lawmakers, we, we filed our legislative bills. Mm -hmm. uh, both of us can, can talk about that. I think I, we filed 73 bills, which was quite, quite ambitious. Um, and then the Senate President and the Speaker make appointments. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Senate President uh, appointed me uh, I'm, I'm helming the Joint Committee on Mental Health, Substance Use, and wow. Recovery. Uh, so, you know, talking a little bit about the open epidemic and medical assisted treatment, but, you know, as this epidemic continues to rage uh, and disproportionately impacts southeastern mm -hmm. Massachusetts, including the island, critically important, also uh, mental health parity mm -hmm. is a uh, really big challenge, right? That people just really aren't getting access and coverage of mental health in the way that they um, get care for, for medical or surgical procedures. Mm -hmm. This actually is like the, the number one personal priority of the Senate president mm -hmm. um, because just her in, in her family she's experienced this so it's a real honor to be asked to to lead that uh, and then I also was appointed as the assistant majority whip which are probably like what wow. is that? Uh, so that is um, a is, member. Is that, is that you know you, this is your second term. This is my second term and, so and, I was appointed and, and, to and leadership. To, and, to, and to be pushed up like that is that unusual? Oh, yeah. Yes, it's, it's, it's very. It's, it's, I mean, it's really <laughs> incredible, uh, and um, and we're all really fortunate to have Julian in the Senate uh, appointed to a leadership post uh, in his in his sophomore term, which is truly remarkable and just speaks to um, the amount of respect Julian has in the Senate, and um, I think it's helpful to all of us on the Cape and Islands who can how lean you, on him for things. <laughs> <like that. laughs> but no, it's it's really remarkable. But and, how uh, do you guys get Julian's. along? You, you're Democrats. How do you get along with the Republican? Uh, Wonderfully, Governor. Oh, with the governor. So, with our delegation, I mm -hmm. would say. So, the Cape and Islands. There's eight of us who represent Cape Cod, Martha's Vineyard, right. and Nantucket. Uh, three of us are Democrats: Dylan and I, and then uh -huh. Rep. Sarah Peak, uh, who was from the Outer Cape, who's also actually in leadership in the House. Uh, and then the rest of the folks are, are Republicans. We work great with them. I, I think that. Why can't um, they do that down there in Washington? I, I don't know, but it makes me really <laughs> grateful for. Look at what we uh, do here. <laughs> really grateful to be, uh -huh. you know, here in Massachusetts, working at the state level. Um, you know, with the administration, work well with them as well. Uh, but the partnership, really, with this Cape and Islands delegation is mm -hmm. really close. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they really have our backs. We often have theirs. Yeah. And, and often, you know, nine out of ten of the issues that you're fighting for at the state level, it, it, it's not partisan issues. You right. know, a lot of it's like, all right, how do we figure, you know, how are we going to figure out how you get medically assisted treatment on island, right? Mm -hmm. How are you going to navigate the, you know, multi-billion dollar wastewater crisis that mm -hmm. we have on Cape Cod, on Martha's Vineyard. Because yeah, that affects both Republicans, right. Democrat, right. and right. Independent. Yeah, it's right. not partisan stuff. Right. And so, you know, I, I think that spirit of collaboration, for me, I, I, I didn't expect this. I mean, actually, both of us started off our careers as, as organizers working, you know, right. for really right. progressive right. candidates. <laughs> right. yeah. um, you know, and to me, it really has, like, restored my faith in mm -hmm. just the Republic. And, you know, certainly, certainly makes me thankful for, to be working on Beacon Hill. Right. Um, I, I don't envy 
the, the task of folks in DC. I have a list of, 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 of <laughs> things here ahead, that, that we're talking about, acts that, that uh, Leslie gave me here. And I, I just said, uh, the act of encouraging home ownership. Exp explain that. Yeah, so, um, so there's a couple of bills that, that Julian and I have both filed uh, in the House and Senate mm -hmm. around, basically around addressing our housing needs here. We okay. have critical housing needs on the critical uh, statewide it's yeah. an issue it's an incredible it really? issue and then every almost every community in the state uh, uh, has specific housing needs but on the Cape and Islands were uh, particularly impacted because folks looking to own a home here or rent a home here or you know just reside here mm -hmm. are competing with an uh, a market that is really an international market of extremely wealthy buyers right. and so how does someone like me or Julian who uh, grew up here, loves it here, but works on a government salary, <laughs> afford to compete with, um, you know, uh, folks, right, right, bu buying homes, you know, international buyers, or, or has anyone, a nurse, a teacher, a firefighter, police officer, how, how can they afford a home here? And so we filed a number of pieces of legislation on this. Mm -hmm. One piece that's been gaining um, a significant amount of attention uh, because also this is something that Boston and the greater Boston area are looking to do as well as a, a, a transfer fee on home sales, mm -hmm. so, similar to how the land bank is set right, up, right, but having right. a separate transfer fee uh, that local communities can opt into if they choose mm -hmm. and have that transfer fee instead of going to um, uh, land conservation to go towards a housing bank for affordable housing. And so that's a bill that I filed uh, in the house. And I said, every home it gives a it gives a lot of leeway to local uh, communities, but any home over a million dollars, you can impose a transfer fee on. So if it's a two million dollar home and the town decides to have the million dollar threshold, mm -hmm. then um, you could go up to two percent of that over a million dollars to go towards uh, an affordable so housing bank. Them? So that would be the home buyer. The home buyer case. would so pay. We would pay the two percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so if we say if we say the town, so we say it's a two million dollar ho right. home, and we say uh, the town sets the threshold at a okay. million dollars, right. the town can always go higher. They can right, set right, two right, million dollar right, threshold. Right, they can right. do whatever they want, uh, as long as it's above a million dollars. So, let's say it's a million dollar threshold, uh, a one percent fee, and it's a two million dollar home. Mm -hmm. That one percent fee only applies to the second million. Right. So you only tax that one million, million dollars, right. and one percent of that would be ten thousand right. dollars. And so. You know, I think it's a really modest ask to ask these ultra rich, ultra wealthy people. If you pay people, two million dollars right. or something, what's ten thousand dollars? Right, buy, buy, exactly. That's like, a, that's like a buck right. to us, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. I know. Like, if and so these ultra rich, ultra wealthy people buying multi million dollar homes, and you know, they're not meaning to, but they are displacing the local residents here. Yeah, they um, should they can afford to? And I think it's a matter of just equity that they they should have to pay a very tiny percentage, percentage of 1% or 2% or half a percent fee to go towards affordable housing for the rest of us. And these, these, multi, these super wealthy people who are buying homes here, they need people to work at the homes. They want people to be able to, to, be able to uh, you know, staff the restaurants that they go to. Uh, they need services themselves here. And so if we just continue to, to displace people at an unsustainable rate, uh, there's not gonna be a, a, an economy here to, to help support people. How is land on the Cape? You know, uh, when I look at land, I know that parts of the vineyard, you know, certain areas of the vineyard need to, you, in order to build a house, you have to have either an acre and a half or three yep. acres. That's a lot of land. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of land to say for one house, regardless of how big the house is. That's a lot of land. How is the Cape? Is the Cape in the same situation? The, the Cape's very similar. Okay. Uh, and actually, the whole region, right, really faces uh, a, a number of very sort of similar challenges, mm -hmm. right, that we've become this profoundly unaffordable place. Okay. You know, we have a really strong second home market, right. which, which does mean, you know, a, a lot of money kind mm -hmm. of flowing into our communities. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just meant, as Dylan was saying, you know, these are just places that are, where are this real inflection point of sustainability? Can, you know, can this be a sustainable place where people can, can live and make lives? And in large part due to the very uh, high out of whack cost of real estate, um, it's just harder and harder to make a life here. And so what we're trying to do 
both in you know, the, the transfer tax that Dylan was talking mm -hmm. about, the broader push for zoning reform mm -hmm. at the state level. I filed a bill, uh, it's called an act relative to attainable housing in mm -hmm. seasonal communities. Mm -hmm. So it's getting at all the different challenges and issues that we've heard from you know, affordable housing developers and planners and realtors um, and, and just citizens about challenges that they face in getting more housing for people. Here's your question. Yeah. In saying that, because the affordable housing market, I believe, affects the business owners. Mm -hmm. If number if, one, w number if, one issue is workforce housing. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Now, Absolutely. I can remember way back when both of you were running for the first time. That was one of your main issues, trying to work in that so that we had affordable housing for people that wanted to live here. Yep. That we had sustainable housing for the business, so businesses could draw from that mm -hmm. affordable housing, right? And that. We're not going to overgrow the Cape and the Islands, but we're going to make it so that it's feasible for everybody. Yep. You know, on the island right now, if I'm not mistaken, they're, they're coming up with, in fact, I have a, a, a show with a young lady tomorrow that's talking about house, housing bank, yep. housing bank funds, you know, monies like that to, to put away for certain things. You know, we're all running into the same partnership and, and it's affecting businesses. Once a businesses in our domain get affected, people stop coming. Right. And people yeah, stop coming, right, yeah. money doesn't grow, and then you and just And they've have been it. affected for right. you know, 10, 20 years. Right. Workforce has been such a challenge. One of the biggest things that we, we could do on this and we've actually taken action mm -hmm. on um, is providing support for wastewater infrastructure. Wastewater is a critical issue across the region. On Cape Cod, actually, there was court action uh, taken against the towns uh, because of their lack of wastewater management. Um, here on Martha's Vineyard, uh, you've got some of the same challenges, particularly uh, on the Down Island towns. Right. Uh, and so actually part of this um, room occupancy legislation that was passed, so this expansion of room occupancy, which is going to mean big, big things for, for our towns with the local option, uh, expanding short-term, you know, the, the occupancy tax to short-term rentals and Airbnbs and the like. Um, we got a bill, as part of that package, we created a Cape Cod and Islands Water Protection Fund which over the life of the fund is going to funnel about a billion dollars to the region on wastewater infrastructure. Cape Cod is automatically in that fund, and the Martha's Vineyard towns, the six island towns, have the option to come into that fund. That fund will provide, uh, we like to call it, you know, other people's money, right? Mm -hmm. Non-revenue non not generated from property taxes or from betterments mm -hmm. that island towns can use to build wastewater infrastructure, which immediately gets at that density point you were making. Right. Part of the reason our zoning has, you know, an acre or an acre and a half requirement is it's attached to the Title V system and the space you need for it. So okay. wastewater directly attaches to housing. We've done a lot of wastewater. Now we got to work on does, the zoning. Does the reform. Cape have a wastewater system? No. In, <laughs> uh, what, what I'm trying to say yeah. is, I could remember way back, you know, when I was a little younger, or a lot younger. Uh, Edgar Town seemed like they're always underwater especially high tides in restaurants. So they put the sewer system in, yeah. okay? And then they put the wastewater system in. They don't have that problem anymore. Mm -hmm. And their businesses, their restaurants and hotels flourished. Yeah. And I'm saying to myself, what if the Cape Cod, from Provincetown mm -hmm. all the way up to the Bourne Bridge, what if they put a wastewater system in it on a piece of land that was remote from most of the housing, okay? And put a system in there that would help all the Cape. They say that the water that comes out of the wastewater system on the vineyard, once it's gone through the process, is almost drink is actually drinkable. Mm -hmm. Well, if that's the case, you can actually put that water any place, yeah. back into the ocean if you had to, yeah. to put it back in there. Yep. And that would benefit not only the housing, but the restaurants and everything there. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's well, there's 15 towns, right? Right. And so every town. <laughs> yeah, I know. You think there, there, you there, there you go. I mean, you went to that. I knew is, yeah. <laughs> and you're an island with six towns. But um, uh, so each town has is is in a different part, right. is in a different place. Falmouth has, uh, my hometown has a very large uh, wastewater treatment facility. Um, some towns have made six significant investments. Others are really far behind. But one of the um, really terrific advantages of this legislation that Julian's talking about, um, the Cape and Islands uh, uh, Wastewater Protection Fund. Um, this is a fund paid for by the 2.75% right. mm -hmm. um, uh, 
you know, fee uh, that goes towards water protection and water quality improvement throughout the entire Cape and mm -hmm. Islands. And so there's a, there are a lot of projects here, mm -hmm. uh, especially on the vineyard that cost a ton of money when you think about um, yeah, either upgrading septic systems, when you talk about putting in pipes and pumps, that's right. the most expensive thing, but also um, the most impactful in terms of uh, nitrogen mitigation and the like. But all of these projects cost a ton of money. And our greatest resource here on the Cape and Islands, our greatest natural resource at least, is our pristine water. That's why right. millions of people come here every year. That's why we love calling the Cape and Islands our home. And so this designated fund uh, over you know, the next 50 years is projected to raise around a billion dollars. It'll probably raise more than that. We don't. We don't. We won't know until we mm -hmm. this, the funds fully set up. And so that go. So that money will be used directly towards water quality projects across the Cape and here on the island. If the island towns could, choose to be a part could, of it, how could people yeah. say, for instance, you know, like most of the people on the island, especially up island, and and, mm -hmm. and even myself in Vineyard Haven, only downtown Vineyard Haven has this the sewer system in it. Yep. I'm I'm still on the septic system, right? But if somebody came to me and said, listen, we're going to put sewerage all through this town, mm -hmm. okay, and we're going to run it, and you're no longer going to have your septic system, but we're going to tax you right. over the next 30 years right. on that sewer system. Mm -hmm. So in other words, I'm going to pay an extra, say, $200 a year on yep. that system. Wouldn't that benefit the projects that you, wanna, that you would want to yeah. do? And wouldn't you I would think that people in the community would say, hey, that's great. Yeah. So uh, the beautiful thing about this fund that we set uh -huh. up is that you're right. If, if the towns on the vineyard mm -hmm. do not join this fund, mm -hmm. then they're going to be going to their property owners and they're going to be going to town meeting and say, hey, we need to fund all these water quality projects. Yeah. This is going to come from a property tax increase that you guys are all going to have to pay and we're going to um, you know, be raising how much money you guys much, are going to be yeah. spending uh, every month as part of your bill. Now, if they join the trust fund, mm -hmm. they'll have a designated revenue stream paid for by uh, the people who visit us seasonally, visit us for a week or two weeks or three mm -hmm. weeks, a month, um, well, maybe a little under a month, uh, a year. And that money, uh, you know, the, these, these are folks that come here seasonally. These are folks that use all of our resources mm -hmm that we have to pay for. And we, and we pay for resources, not for you know, the six months of the year when people aren't here, but we pay for, we foot the bill for resources for the entire year um, uh, and taking into account that the population you know, raises by 10% in the summertime. And so the folks coming in, adding to all those costs to our, our towns should be able to pay uh, a very small percentage. And if, and if the towns don't opt in to that percentage, then they're going to have to go back to their, their residents within the town and say, hey, we're going to have to raise well, your taxes this, and for this. And this is the real decision point before the Six Island Towns right mm -hmm. now, is whether or not do they take advantage of this opportunity. Both Dylan and I fought very hard to make sure that Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket had a seat at, that ta at this table, had an opportunity mm -hmm. to get in. And so now it's up, the t up to the towns whether the, or not they want to join. We actually just had a meeting earlier today yep. uh, with a whole host of stakeholders in the Martha's Vineyard Commission and, and representatives from all the towns. Um, but you know, if you care about uh, housing and affordable housing and housing production, if you care about you know, cleaning up and keeping our bays and estuaries uh, pristine, uh, this is really something that's really worth a look and really encourage viewers to, to research this and, and get mm -hmm. some information and reach out to your town. Let me explain something to you. Sure. What you're talking about, we, my wife and I go to Aruba every year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And part of our fee, our fee mm -hmm. while we're there, mm -hmm. when we leave, they charge us for using the water and whatnot, yep. $27 a day. Wow. Twenty-seven wow. dollars a crazy. day. So at the end of the week, I got a good oh my idea. Huh? <laughs> twenty-seven dollars a day. Now I do not know if that's for the people that live there. Yep. I'm talking uh -huh. about have houses there, but for yeah, all the hotels, yeah. for all those people that's in the hotels, no. and some of them might be paying a little more. Yeah. But we're paying twenty-seven dollars a day, yeah. and and none of us bat an eye. Right. At the end yeah. of the week, oh, when yeah. you come up and say, "Okay, here's my bill. Boom. Here it is. This it is." But I'm saying to myself, "Hmm." I said, "What happens if?" All the hotels here did that, and maybe 
the people that are renting houses right. did and, that. And that's so, what we're talking about. Yeah, that's, what that's exactly says. what this is. Mm -hmm. And I think you raise another great point is that you can't, you can't there. visit. You, there's very few c comparable destinations right. like Martha's Vineyard that you can visit that are not looking to use, use fees and room occupancy mm -hmm. to generate revenue, especially mm -hmm. for seasonal communities right. where you know, we've, we've got to support a community out here year round, mm. uh, and, and, and this, is a, this is a real way to do it. And so mm. we've both been looking at strategies, mm -hmm. you know, that can mm. enhance our ability to safeguard mm -hmm. environment, mm -hmm. you know, promote housing production, uh, and really help make this a more sustainable place uh, so that you don't have this, you know, situation yeah. that a lot of islanders, uh, island families are in, and, and our families are in this too, yeah. just basically questioning, you know, how, how do you make a life here? Mm -hmm. And the 2.75%. So the reason, one of the reasons we took the 2.75% is because that is what you pay when you go to Boston, yeah. Springfield, Worcester. Whenever you stay in a hotel motel there, you pay 2.75% and that money goes directly to their convention centers because their convention centers you know, drive, they argue drive business, right. drive tourism. Right. Well, our water quality here is what drives people exactly. to the Cape and yeah, Islands. Exactly. And by the way, I bet 90% of people who rent, a, who, who rent a hotel or go stay in a hotel B&B in Boston or Springfield or Worcester, they don't bat an eye at the 2.75%. Oh, they no. don't even know it exists. That is exactly. Right. That's yeah. exactly. I bet 90% have no what is it? What is it? 190 yeah. at $250 yeah. here. Right. Here's your money. And so, and so I, we think, you know, we don't want a Cape and Islands uh, convention center. Maybe that's a conversation for another time. <laughs> no, what, no. We want, what we want is, is to protect our greatest natural resource exactly. here in our in our water. Listen, before you guys take off, I, I want I got this um, effective healthcare and right. Tell me about that. Sure. So that's under there's your a whole you know healthcare and healthcare reform is kind of part of our DNA here in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the the next step in that there's a lot of conversation nationally, but also in the state about looking at how do you you know the options of a single payer system. How would you right. move to a single payer system? Uh, you know, I like to use the analogy of, you know, those rubber band balls right, that you right, get, right, you know, right, right. The, the, that's kind of what our healthcare system is structured like, right? You got all these, all these pieces that have been added on, right, added right, on, right, added right. on. It's profoundly complicated. Um, and so I filed legislation uh, that creates a roadmap to studying how we would move to a single payer system. Mm -hmm. uh, it requires the studying of our current system over three years and at the same time looking at what it would cost to have a single payer system, and then to build a roadmap around how you'd actually begin to implement that to peel back all those layers of that rubber band ball I was talking about. Um, so in the Senate, we actually passed this last session mm -hmm. on a vote of 33 to five, a bipartisan vote. Um, we're gonna be looking to take it up again. Uh, there's a whole host of healthcare issues working on. I'm actually really proud I sit on uh, all the committees related to healthcare issues. Quick, so I, gotta have a, I get one. to have a say on We got that. about yeah. 30 seconds. 30 seconds, sure. Are you agreeing with Bernie Sanders on that? On the health care? Yeah, I mean, if I, if I was serving in Congress, I'd mm -hmm. support Bernie Sanders' bill, okay. Medicare for All. Uh, yeah, I, I, I support a Medicare for All option as okay. well. I think, though, that we've got to be really honest with people about mm -hmm. how do you get there. Okay. And it's not one of these things that you can go, right. you know, take a vote, flip a light switch. Right. You've got a real transition, right. and then you really got to look at it carefully. And that's what we're trying to do in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, you know one thing? You guys come over more than anybody that I've ever seen as a representatives, senators and representatives. And, and like I always said, you got an open invitation to come, right? So when we had talked about the veterans, you said you would maybe come over. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, come over we'll and, and work yeah. with these guys, okay? I, love I enjoy you guys coming over. It hey. just makes my heart feel good. <laughs> this makes me feel good to yeah. have, you know, uh, two guys. Uh, can I call them Starchy and Hutch? <laughs> oh, wow. who's, who's, who's now? Who's <laughs> now? That's your decision to make. Right, okay. okay we'll and listen, that. thanks for coming. Thank you, Dr. Tankard. And Thank thanks you. for tuning in to Tank Talk. All Until right. next time, this is your host, Bob Tankard, saying good evening. <laughs>